Good evening, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Goldstein, the president of the Municipal Art Society, and thank you for joining us tonight for this virtual gallery talk on uh, Melissa O'Shaughnessy's Sidewalk Ballet, the latest exhibition on view at MAS's Dorsey and Alan J. Friedman Gallery. It will be up through um, the middle of August, so I hope you've had a chance to look at it already, but if not, please do after our conversation tonight. O'Shaughnessy's work captures people as they move with and around one another through New York's built environment. The exhibition is inspired by Jane Jacobs' concept of the sidewalk ba a ballet, the vitality and character that pedestrians bring to urban public space just by the act of moving through it. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to the chat where the MAS staff has placed some helpful tips, including information about closed captioning for tonight's program. If you need assistance during the event, please feel free to message MAS using the um, chat function directly. Throughout the event, we invite you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions about Melissa's work. I will be integrating those questions as much as I can um, throughout the event, uh, plus we'll spend a little bit of time on those at the end of the program. Now I am just delighted and thrilled to introduce a Melissa O'Shaughnessy. Melissa was born in 1960 in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and studied at Georgetown University and the University of St. Thomas, graduating with a degree in journalism. Uh, she is now a photographer based in New York City. Her work has been featured in numerous international exhibitions and publications, and is included in the book Bystander, A History of Street Photography, and the recently published Women's Street Photographers. She is a member of UP Photographers, a collective of 25 international uh, street photographers, and her first monogram, Perfect Strangers, what a great title, New York City's uh, Street of photographs was published by Aperture in October, 2020. Welcome, Melissa. We'll start this evening by Melissa sharing a few of her photographs and talking a little bit about the work. And then we'll, we'll I have some questions to ask myself. So I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks everyone for being here. And thanks especially to Elizabeth and the whole team at Mass uh, New York City for uh, inviting me to have this show online and to speak to you all here tonight. It's an honor and a great pleasure. So let me just begin by um, showing you the pictures. And as I go through the gallery show, I will talk a little about my background and about the pictures and how I do what I do. Um, hopefully I won't go on too, too long, but I'll give each picture a few minutes and We'll go from there. Um, I started on working on the street in oh, about 2014 when my youngest child went off to college. I had taken a workshop from Joel Meyerowitz and was very inspired not just by his broad by, body of work, but by something he said about street photography. He said that really working on the street unplanned um, quickly and unobtrusively was in a way the purest form of photography, that it, it, it's, it's photography's unique um, capacity as an art form is to catch a split second. Um, and that really stuck with me. I mean, you can do portraits with a camera, you can do portraits in a painting, you can paint a landscape, you can photograph a landscape, but that instantaneous 500th of a second is what the camera does specifically so incredibly well. Um, this photograph here that we're looking at is Fifth Avenue on a very cold winter afternoon. Um, the light lighting the, the hot dog stand, which is so ubiqu ubiquitous to New York City. Um, and at the center of it, the woman with her hand raised. And what I'm always looking for on the street is a gesture, a movement, an expression, something that, that enlivens a picture to be more than just a, an interesting scene of pretty colors and interesting people. Um, I'm always looking for the gesture. Here, the sun's a gesture, the woman's hand's a gesture, the backlight is a gesture, the steam off the food cart is a gesture of a sorts. And they all kind of combined to make you feel what the straight felt like on this cold January day. You see the gesture, you see the steam, you see, and, and here we've presented in the first picture in the gallery, uh, 
the city as a character. And, and, and you will conti continue to see this in the photographs that we chose for this exhibition. Um, this is down near Madison Square Park. I, I, I'm greatly attracted to color, obviously these wonderful turbans, but it's, again, we have a gesture in the middle. We have the yellow of the street lamps um, matching the turbans. And so I'm always in the, the framing of the architecture and the skyway over the, over the Sikh uh, men at their parade. So I'm always looking not only for a moment, but a moment that's well composed and has things that draw you into the frame. It's often small things that'll be interesting, a walk sign, a one-way sign, a yellow street light. You know, the, the way things are arranged are very important to me when I'm out shooting. Um, most often when you're shooting in the street, your pictures are a failure and, and it's a mess and people's heads are overlapping and it's not interesting. So I'm always looking for places in the city where I know the light's going to be interesting, where I can stand in a certain place like here, you know, the, the shadows on an afternoon in lower Manhattan are beautiful. And, and I did very, very purposely stand where I stood to give the the buildings on the right and the blue sky, a little bit of a presence, but I was most interested in what might be happening in front of that wall and the shadows that people would catch. And I probably stood there for, you know, 15, 10, 15 minutes waiting as people were coming in and out of the frame. And, and when you look at your pictures later, you look for the one that, that you know, where things all clicked and, and this young man's beautiful expression kind of carries up through the, through the street lamp. The woman shrouded in, 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 in a scarf because the sun is so hot and strong. Um, but I think it really feels like lower Manhattan. This is uh, again me looking for color. This door at, on the, uh, in the meatpacking district at the Standard Hotel. I stood there, I went there a couple mornings thinking I gotta make something with this door and people coming and going and in and out. But it was this guy. And what interests me about it is that. It's like, where did the architects decide to put that window in that door? And this guy is every man because he's the right height. If I went through it, you get the top of my head. I'm short. If someone tall went through it, you get, you know, their neck. But it's kind of interesting. It makes you think about what was the architect thinking? How did he choose at what level that window was going to go? So obviously there's an average size man and he is it. But it's a nice, it's a nice moment and a nice gesture. But I think about those things when I'm shooting and, and very often afterwards. This down in Chinatown, I've been chasing this ever changing graffiti wall and I've been shooting it for six or seven years. And every couple months, a new graffiti artist comes and does something different or they paint it over and people tag it. And it's, it's a good spot with people coming in and out of the subway and it feels, I'm attracted to whenever I find primary colors. So the red, the yellow, the blue, this obviously at a time, you know, deep in the pandemic, everyone is masked and um, it's a moment. I, I kind of hate the masks, but it is, it does speak to our time. Um, and it's kind of nice that everyone is masked. Uh, it, it dates it, but in a way that perhaps in time will be meaningful. Um, this one really, to me, speaks of the street ballet, and I'm something street photographers always do is again try to make order, to make order from the chaos. And it is just New York. Anyone who's been here in many big cities is just people plodding around, running the errands, and 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 on their way or in their phones. And how do you make something that's really ordinary on the street? become an interesting picture, to become something that moves into extraordinary. And for me, I mean, many people might look at this and just say, huh, it's just people walking by and it is, but it's, it's the choreography. If you look at everyone's feet, their most legs are splayed a little bit. Very few people have, are visibly into their phones. It's a corner that's it's under construction and it was ever changing. So again, this was a spot that I would regularly go back to. And I have a Madonna as, as, as the central figure. She's wearing kind of the blue that Madonna always wear. And she's, she's beautiful in a very casual way. Um, and it's those little details that I hope 
that the most interesting street photographs tend to have. They, they wanna make you linger, think about why the photographer was interested and to be finding details that speak of our time and speak of just the human condition. Coffee, cell phones, errands. I mean, these are the things that, that uh, are part of our lives. I love older women. Um, this woman pushing along, you know, height of the pandemic, the city was boarded up and, but not too long after, uh, decorated uh, by the graffiti artists. And this is a wonderful spot on Fifth Avenue, very close to where I live. I think I was headed home and tired at the end of the day and her marvelous slicker and the way she is just powering through this time delighted me. Again, uh, she's my central character. She, she um, I published a book with Aperture as Elizabeth mentioned um, a couple years ago and I opened with her. I thought that she represented for me, you know, I'm not young anymore. I looked at her, she has an, ad, she's seen it all. She's has an attitude. She is, she is dressed to kill with that hat on. And I just think she is something for, for me to aspire to. She's, she's, she's confident. She didn't notice me. I took quite a few shots of her. Uh, maybe she noticed me and was posing and I just never found out. Um, but this is 42nd Street and she's, I wish I, she could be my grandmother. I love her. I love the people. I come to love the people in my photographs and I try always to be very, very respectful. Um, I, I like to think that I have a humanist streak. I'm not out to um, take pictures that embarrass or, or look down on people. Um, and this one is just very graphic. It's, it's near Times Square. They painted this hoarding wall red for a while, which was for me, it was like a moth to a flame because I'm always attracted to red. I think this is 45th Street. And that just, for, for me, it's the detail of the, just the little bit of wind and the woman's hair rushing through to wherever she's going. And it's the beautiful varied architecture of and constant construction of New York City. Fleet Week, of course, it's always a delight when the sailors in white appear. Um, this for me is the twist on the tale. Um, the woman uh, ogling the sexy man as opposed to the more common other way around. And children are important in my work. Um, their energy is always delightful. Um, this is the, the GM building up on Fifth Avenue. Um, I chase twins regularly and I was chasing the girls in the Levi coats with their mother on the right. Um, and it was maybe interesting, but I knew it wasn't gonna be a, that interesting. It was a pair of girls wearing the same coat. And then this other crew came by. A friend of mine said, this picture is like a full house. So sometimes I was following them for a couple of blocks. So sometimes it just, it, 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 it comes to you. The streets of New York are generous. And this family with the girls dressed alike and the stroller and the colors all came together because I was prepared. I was chasing those other girls. And that's, that's how I've learned to make pictures come together. Lower Manhattan. Um, a statue many of us have photographed, a sculpture. And, you know, it just, again, we're in the pandemic, we have a lot of masks, but the red cube and the yellow walk lights and the blue jeans, I, uh, you know, my brain starts clicking. And then her gesture, like she's helping him on the computer. I don't, I don't know what prompted that response, whether it was she was gonna set something there or she was posing, but it's funny, it's a little, it's a little funny. 42nd and 8th, uh, again, my, my, my always trying to make order of the, the pedestrian chaos. And this woman, kind of very pensive, beautiful woman in, in a flowered dress amidst kind of the drab rest of it was my moment. And, you know, most of the time, those pictures don't work out. But I'm also interested in what happens at the edges of a frame. So we, we have an arm and we have, a, a, I try to be very, specific about tight edges and having interesting things going on all over the frame. It, 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 gives, it gives a static two-dimensional picture energy. Um, if not, everything is smack dab center and um, carefully placed. 
All my work is spontaneous. I do not pose people. I rarely talk to people unless they ask me if I've taken their picture and want to know. Um, I'm quick, I'm small, I dress in black most of the time. Um, and so this is all just the city as it's presenting itself to me. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures, the mother and daughter. Um, I have two daughters and it's a little bit of a lesson in how our faces fall, but it's astonishing the genetic, you know, the gesture, they have the same gesture, they're inclined the same way that you can see that they're mother and daughter. And it's, you know, the strand, which I adore. And it was a moment and I was on my way home to lunch. Um, and these are, these are really quick, quick observations. And most of them go in the trash, but sometimes you find a treasure. This is 17th Street near my apartment. Um, the reflection in and out of the Barnes and Noble store. And what makes this picture for me is that he's he's got a Band-Aid on his nose. And it's it's those little details. You know, why did he does he have a, did he have a nose job? Did he have a bug bite? It you know it's those little human tiny little frailties sometimes that can make a picture interesting. Fifth and 42nd. I've had a lot of people, you know, some people think she's beautiful. Some people think she looks a little empty. I think she looks very deep within herself. She is in her phone, which I, I try to avoid too many phones in my photos, but it, she's very deep within herself in this very crowded corner. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm attracted to that. Yeah, you'll see that often in my pictures. It's how we maneuver this crowded city kind of sometimes just deep within ourselves and our own thoughts and, and phones, unfortunately. This was an early picture, I think 2014 or 15. We were in our phones then, but it's, it's, this is Times Square. It's funny people, you know, the world is burning and we're looking at Instagram. Eighth Avenue, late afternoon. The light in, in, in the winter time and fall, winter and spring is, is can be so beautiful in New York when the light is low, illuminating, illuminating the architecture. Central Park, again, trying to make something interest out of, interesting out of not just the architecture, but how people are moving through space. Um, I've shot this quite a bit and this day the light was good and I happened to get four dogs and a woman's hair backlit and a boy on a bike. And it, 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 there's just enough, I think, to look at beyond the setting to make you think about how people move through the city. Here too, um, Washington Square Park, it's become very crowded and, and lively during the pandemic. Uh, this is just the scene and the crowd, but it's the woman crossing the way she, her legs are crossed across the center and, and gently flipping her hair, she becomes, she anchors the picture into something human rather than just a city scene. And I'm always, always looking for that. Union Square and, and pandemic style. I love wind because again, it can take a, a, a photograph and animate it with, with action that it wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so it's a windy winter day in Soho. Lower Manhattan, you see again, I'm looking for that wind and the architecture and just the, the little detail of her bra strap makes it feel, I mean, to me, it's a tender, it, there's tenderness. I feel tenderness there to just our simple humanity. This was just a lucky day. I've shot this wall on 34th Street was up for a couple of years and it would get dirty and they'd replace it. and. The afternoon light was great. And one day this guy came by, you know, I was just looking for interesting things to happen in front of this wall. And, you know, I, I didn't plan it, but how could I not take a photo of that? I do go to parades, but I tend to avoid, I, I almost never shoot a parade. It, what's interesting is what happens to the people around the parade or in the city after a parade. And this was after Sikh day. Um, in Madison Square Park. And again, sometimes luck favors the prepared. I was crossing the street and there they came, one, two, three. Um, the city is generous. Chinatown, 
this newsstand is no longer there, something you can count on in New York is that things that you love to shoot will disappear or change. Um, but what attracted me here again was the balance and the color, the, the flags, the Chinese characters on the shop, the Chinese bags, the two flags, the two blotches of yellow. It, you know, I watch for the things to come together um, to make this place animated by people and color and odd coincidences. Soho, the light was gorgeous and, and I waited for someone to come in and animate the advertising. Chelsea Flea Market, sometimes I get down low. Um, I wanted to turn him into an undersea creature. Um, his hair was beautiful, um, unkempt and curly, but I knew that it, to be interesting, I crouched down and backed him up to that black scaffolding on a church that had burned. Tiffany's at 57th Street. This was a decoration that was up for a while and Audrey was obviously this guy and his girlfriend or friend had wanted to be Audrey Hepburn at Tiffany's. And what's funny is just that the, the spray painter is just part of the mural. Um, it was just a funny moment. This is a, one of my favorite pictures too. Again, it's just a busy corner, people rushing home from work. Inherently, that's not an interesting scene, but when you have three or four different stories going on, it starts to tell the story of New York and what it's like to live in New York. The old man sat down, he was tired, a friend ran into him and they were chatting. This woman comes sideways with her ear pods, people are rushing and then I got a little wind. And, and that's what can bring a, a, a picture alive. And anyone who's been to New York on a, a windy day knows, knows how it feels. Lower Manhattan, right near Wall Street. Um, I do chase people. Interestingly, this, I saw this, you know, so we're so much more casual these days. And so when you see someone in a bright suit, it's actually far more interesting, I think, than it, than it used to be. So I saw him coming on the phone with his, his umbrella. And I think this was the first shot I took of him. And I chased him for blocks and it wasn't until I got home that I realized I got the moment right away that I, I must have just sensed this ballet coming. Um, and I, I, I love this picture. It's, it's really a picture of nothing, um, but it's a picture on how we maneuver through this beautiful city of ours. And, and framing and, and what you're attracted to all come into play as you build your own body of work. This little, you know, I love photographing children and because I'm a woman, I, I have an easier time of it, I think, than many male street photographers. Um, and, you know, photographs can tell, don't always tell the truth. I mean, it looks like this little girl is all alone. Of course, her parents were just out of the frame, but I excluded them. Um, so that she, I, I could kind of communicate what it felt to be like such a little girl in such a, a big crowded city. The ubiquitous mannequins um, and the man hard at it, Fifth Avenue. Lower Manhattan, again, the, the hoarding walls are, are things are on, on construction. You get a wall that you can have as a background. Um, and sometimes you frame it, you stand there. I thought I've got my food carts, I've got my cube, I've got my wall, and now I just wait for the cast member to come. And of course, it's the red stripe that, that, that did the trick. And this is the last um, photo. She's, um, I ended my book with her. So I, in this show, I kind of opened and ended with this referencing my, my book in a way. Again, an older woman, so beautifully dressed. I would steal that coat off her back. It's so marvelous. It feels like she's carrying the weight of womanhood on her back. This is Fifth Avenue um, on a winter day. And the, her beautiful white hair and the steam talk echoing each other in a way and that ubiquitous orange pipe. Um, and I think she's just lovely. So that's, that's the show.
And um, I would just uh, look forward to questions from all of you and from Elizabeth. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, looking at those photographs again, Melissa. I'm, I'm stunned by their quality, their liveliness, their the ballet of the street for sure. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question just to start us off a little bit. Um, we were very taken with these photographs just as photographs, obviously, but part of the reason, obviously, that this was a perfect fit for the Freeman Gallery was uh, because you're really seeing the, the, um, the character, as you put it, in the context of the, the background, the cityscape itself. And I'm, I'm uh, and you make connections, I think, and I'm uh, uh, between the intertwining of that city itself and the, and the people moving through it as part of your work. And so at least that's what we see. And so I was curious whether that's organic or deliberate. Um, and just if you could talk a little bit about that, it would be. Great. Sure. Well, you know, the city is a is a fantastic setting for street photography because the light, the light in New York bounces around and the city is a, an incredible background and, and then the reflections from the steel and the glass. Um, but I'm always looking to give my street photographs context. You know, that the, you know, if you just put a person in the center of a frame in a park, um, it's it becomes a portrait. It's very much about the person. I want, I, I want my, my work to reflect where I am and the time that I'm living in. So yes, I think you can see, and, and again, I'll go back again, that maybe my book is a little bit more about the people. You know, there's certainly half these photos are in this book, um, but Elizabeth and her team and I chose this body of work to very much be about the city. Um, but when I shoot, I shoot far enough away to bring the city in as a character. It's important to where I am. You know, street photography lives kind of at the border of reportage and documentary. It's, 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 you tend not to be purposeful in trying to tell a particular story. But in time and as, as photos age, it really does become a kind of reportage on how we lived and how we behaved and how we dressed and, and what the city looked like. I mean, city, the city from 50, 60 years ago looked very different. The, the light was a little different, the air was more polluted, you know, it, 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 these things change. So you are making a historical document of a place as, as part of what street photography is. I'm curious, I'm an Instagram follower of yours, and um, I know that you have worked and, and done uh, your uh, photographs in many cities around the world. I, I'm curious, many New Yorkers are bemoaning the homogenization of big cities, um, wanting to preserve character about what's special about New York. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, as you look at this body of work, uh, whether there are things that stand out to you that are the essence of New Yorkness, as opposed to the work you've done in, in other places? Well, I mean, naturally, the architecture and the light to each city has its own character. Um, I think that the certainly the, the, the retail landscape and, and things are becoming homogenized in our culture. But cities, it's pretty hard to change an entire city's character. Um, I think that New York, you know, it's, it's unique density and height um, drive a certain look to, to the pictures. Um, the homogeneity, I think you look at pictures from, of New York from 50 years ago, and certainly the business, businesses signage, it was all much less homogenized. I mean, you could walk, I could make a New York picture look like London and, and, and a Londoner could make a, a, a London picture look like New York if they were keeping out the rest of the city, just in terms of their storefronts and the retail and, and how we dress. So, you know, it, it, I would love to travel back in time to, to trench coats and fedoras and, and um, no cell phones, but we, we we're documenting our times too. And if, and, you know, the cell phones and, and homogenization are, 
a sad part of our time, but it will be something different in, in 50 years. Um, so you kind of got to take what it gives you. Um, I was uh, very struck uh, again, uh, looking at these images about how much color and pattern plays um, uh, such a big part in your work. Um, and New Yorkers are always stereotyped as being dressed in black and that our city is gray. And um, you make a lie of that, I think. Um, are, are you just looking past all of us who are dressed in black? Um, or is it a myth, do you think, it's, as your obs? No, your it's not a myth. And I dress in black all the time. So <laughs> guilt, guilty is charged. Um, but I do that to be unobtrusive. Um, I think because I photograph in color, I'm attracted to color. I'm looking for color. I have a whole folder of photos of people wearing red coats I mean, because it just, it's like, it, it tracks you. Um, so I'm, I'm obviously, I'm attracted to color. And mm -hmm. so you're seeing people dressed probably more colorful um, than is typical. But again, I'm trying to make an interesting picture um, of, of my response to the city. It's also the work, the longer you do it, the more personal you realize your work becomes. If you're paying attention, you're learning something about yourself. And so I'm obviously kind of interested in color and fashion and people who are dressed. I mean, most people are in t-shirts and shorts and athletic wear and black. And it's, it's, that's how most of us do dress, but it's the, it's that little trigger of color or, someone who's presented themselves to the world with a little more care um, that attract me. Uh, absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think there are certain kinds of themes and you've touched on, on some of them in your work, but I'm curious uh, about um, uh, whether there are uh, your twins, for instance, the wind in people's hair, um, things like that. What are, are are you just captivated by those because they're visually attractive to you or have you set out to create a collection of work that includes these sort of themes? Well, it's real. it happens very organically. When we, when we started um, selecting images for, my, for the book at Aperture, um, you know, you don't want your work just to be a random assortment of street photos. And so you try to weave in ideas and themes so that some, as someone goes through just a book of, of, of pictures, of unplanned pictures without a real theme, you know, you want to string an idea through it. And we started with 600 pictures and, and, and the wind, you know, obvious, I love a windy day and I do look for wind, but it became something that could be a little bit of a story that went through the city, um, that went through the edit. And so some of that showed up in, in, in this show as well. So certainly it only becomes a theme if you've explored it. Um, and clearly I was interested in people struggling against the wind. I mean, it's, it's, I was out in this wind too when this was happening. So I, it, it, at the moment you're doing it, you know how it feels. Um, and and, and it, it really does animate people's clothing and hair and it, it it, it, it gives a picture life wind does. So I'm, I, if it's windy, I'm happy to go out because you know, it, it throws some lovely moments at you. Well, it makes still photographs moving images in a, in a funny kind of yeah. way, doesn't it? It's, and, it's and, really... and you know, more interesting, you know, street photography is an interesting genre. It's, 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 it's hard to do well. It's hard to find those moments that are interesting in just a street corner on a Saturday. Um, and, and, but for me, it's people, but then you, you want to animate it beyond just the characters on the street. And the, as we've talked about, the architecture can help you do that. The light can help you do that. The wind can help you do that. A lady's hat can help you do that. And then, then the people on the stage become important. Um, they're very important to me. I, 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 I love people and the people of New York and the visitors to New York and in all their great variety. Um, several people have been uh, captured by this idea of you chasing subjects down the street. And I was <laughs> curious about whether you've ever been caught. Uh, someone wanted to know whether uh, you had been caught doing that. But, but also I think people are, are uh, there are a number of questions um, that people have raised about 
um, whether what happens when people see you taking photographs. You've talked a little bit about the fact that you try to stay um, sort of invisible to to your subjects, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about sure. all those things. And yes, that's a very common question with street photography. Um, when I chase, I, I don't run too fast. When I say chase, I'm usually just, huh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll turn and follow follow that for a minute. Um, if someone catch, if, if, you know, very often people walk by me and they'll, I'll hear, did she just take our picture? <laughs> you know? But again, I'm, I'm very petite. I, I hang my tent camera around like a tourist. You know, I'm really quick with the camera. If someone stops me and say, did you take my picture? you know, aggressively. I mean, it, I've only had a couple of situations where people were really not happy. And I happily delete the photo from my camera. I mean, if it was film, it would be harder. It would be more of an argument. Um, but 99% it, it, of the time I say, you look great. I love your hat. You, you know, <laughs> The way, the way you look at how you look like that person in the, in, you know, in the, in the window. Um, I do this, I just, I love being out in the city. And, you know, I just, I really tell the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and, if, and if you're complimentary and you smile and you give, and, and, and you, people realize that, you know, you're, you're not threatening, you know, it, but if people, if on the one or couple of occasions where people have really been angry, I delete the photo because it's not, it's, it's not worth keeping to me um, because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in people. I, I'm interested in, in, in their expressions and interactions and families and how we all struggle through this city um, with joy and sometimes heavy hearts. So I hope in my demeanor and if I do talk to people, I communicate that and it, it, it diffuses almost everything. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I'm curious uh, if you could go back. You talked a little bit about the workshop that you did with Joel Meyerowitz um, uh, that got you started, he inspired you a little bit, but I am curious about how you got into street photography. What took you to that workshop in the first place? What is it that, that um, moved you into this particular area of the photographic profession? A great question. I think you know, I had started when my son was a teenager, he had taken a photography course in high school and he wanted to put a dark room in our basement. And knowing my son, I thought, oh, Lord, if if he wants a dark room, I better learn how to use it because his passions come and go rather quickly at the age of 16. So I went and took a local course in a black and white photography lab, you know, at a local university and learned black and white photo processing and film, you know, so I worked for a number of years just kind of locally in, in, in my neighborhood taking black and white photographs. Um, and, you know, I was getting, I was working with medium form, format cameras and processing my own for, film. My work wasn't very good. I wasn't living in the city at the time, um, but I had caught the bug of photography and how it can really, um, it is so, it is such a marvelous, art form in that it makes you so present and aware of wherever you are. So after doing that for a few years, I, I knew of Joel's work and I, there was a workshop offered in, in, um, in uh, Palm, Palm Springs and it was cold winter. I think it was March. I thought, well, that sounds nice. You know, trip to, <laughs> to, to Palm Springs and Joel's just, he's become a, a friend and he's been a mentor and he's a, a an incredible artist and it was that line that he said you know that street photography it's really there's it's really the key to to photography the street um and i was so shy when i began but but at that time um we my husband and i had gotten a little apartment in the city because a couple of our kids were living there and so I just started going out and I was just very shy, but the more I did it, the more I realized that the pictures that I was interested in looking at were pictures of people and, and real life and unplanned moments. That the more, the, the more I dug into photography, the more I realized that that's what interested me to look at. And it took me a long time to be able to do it because there's a, there's a great hurdle of shyness that you have to get over. And it's usually just that first couple pictures that you make that you think, huh, maybe I, maybe I can do this. And now I'm not shy at all. I mean, sometimes I start a little slow, but um, 
I, 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 it's like a muscle. It's like anything you practice um, by getting out and doing it and getting those first pictures that you think are interesting um, keeps you going out there. And then it becomes fairly obsessive. Um, I'm curious what it's been like being a woman in this, um, uh, in this profession because street photographers tend to be men, although obviously uh, there's been a movement to gather and support women street photographers. And I'm just curious what it's been like uh, for you as a woman in this profession. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and it's a great question because I think women have always been out on the street working. Um, but as in many areas, they didn't get a lot of recognition. I think that for me, I didn't start doing this until uh, my youngest went to college. And I think there's the issue of finding the time to do it if you have children or mm -hmm. a full-time job. And, and that's a challenge for men as well. It's the, but I think women in many areas weren't given credit for the work that they did in history. Um, there are more men than women doing this. I mean, more of the friends that I've made on all these busy street corners are, it's, it, it's still, I think there are more men practicing this genre. Um, but I, I, and when I started off, I thought, oh, I'm just, I'm not a man. And do I, can I have the aggression? It doesn't take aggression to do this. And the more I did it, the more I realized being a woman is a fantastic advantage. Because once you get over, everyone's shy when they start, man, woman, it, it doesn't matter. Um, but now, because I'm, I'm fairly petite and a woman, I'm not as threat, you know, I know most men won't take pictures of children and, and children are important in the landscape of the street and families and crying babies and babies in strollers and, and children are so expressive and men really stay away from photographing children because, you know, in this day and age, they get in trouble and they, you know, they're not, they're, the ones I know are not after anything bad, but the perception is such. So now I feel, at a huge advantage uh, being mm -hmm. a woman now that I've mustered up all that courage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a number of questions from the audience that are around how much editing you do of the images themselves once you've captured them. Um, are you doing a lot of cropping, altering of color, um, things of that nature? Um, a little bit here and a little bit there. I don't radically change the color. It's uh, what you see is pretty much coming out of my camera. Um, I shoot in what they call raw, which is a, a very basic format that does need some color enhancement. Um, but I, 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 I'm very careful to try to make my color look um, as, it, as I perceived it on the street. So I am shooting things that are more vibrant, but I am not in, intentionally in any way giving my photos a, a vibrance that the city didn't have. And light plays a part. I try to shoot when the light's a little low and, and, and illuminating things that, that does enhance color. Um, if you shoot from with the light in front of you, everything starts to look washed out. And you'll see that in my work too. So I don't artificially um, ramp up the color in any way. And I'll crop a little bit here and there, but it, the famous saying is you can't save a, a, a bad photo by, by um, aggressive cropping. So if there's one little, you know, was this photo that's up on the screen now crop, maybe a little, you know, maybe a smidge in here and a smidge in there to take out, you know, a, a, a teeny corner of the building that might've been on, on the upper left or something just to, to make it more pleasing. But typically my, my cropping is not very radical. Uh, there's been lots of compliments and, and uh, comparisons to photographers like uh, Bill Cunningham, um, uh, obviously, who, who was the capturer of fashion in New York for, for a very long time and, and lots of attention to the, to the stunning qualities of your finished images. So I will, I will let you read through those uh, yourself. But um, there's been one, one question about whether when you publish a photograph that's clearly someone, whether you have to have permission to, to um, do that. That's another very common question. And it's because, you know, everyone thinks, well, it's me. Does she have the right to publish it? I do not have the right to publish it if I'm trying to sell shampoo. You know, I cannot use my photographs 
as um, as as something to sell something or um, but as artwork, I am protected, you know, by our First Amendment. And this country, despite things we've lost recently terribly, um, the First Amendment is, is holding strong. And so this is considered self-expression, really. Um, and so I said my book is sold as a work of art, not as something that is selling, um, you know, cell phones or backpacks or you know, um, a particular brand of t-shirt. If that was the case and my image was used to sell, you know, a backpack, I would have to have a release from the person in the photograph. But the last thing I want to do is chase around getting releases from the people that I'm trying not to be noticed by. Um, so it's, 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 it's a very interesting and important distinction that I am not using people for some sort of commerce. I could sell my photo, but that would be my artwork um, that was not trying to use someone for another purpose. So. Very important distinction uh, and uh, very helpful. You mentioned the cell phone. I'm just, I'm uh, curious about how the ubiquitous cell phone in everybody's hands, but also everybody taking pictures has affected the, the profession of street photographers and um, street photography and, and whether it's been a good thing or a bad thing. Well, yeah. like anything, it's both. Um, the, <laughs> every street photographer I know hates this picture, you know, where we're just <laughs> staring, I mean, just the picture you the picture up now just the middle man in the middle staring at his phone if that was the picture it would be completely uninteresting um what's interesting about this picture is that it becomes about how we're so buried in our phones that we're we're ignoring the the planet you know on fire around us so it's from a from a pictorial standpoint i know most street photographers just hate that people are on their cell phones all the time because they're not looking at each other. They're not interacting with each other. They've got their face in this screen. The flip side of that, of course, is that is everyone is taking pictures of everything all the time. And it provides a, a sort of cover for the street photographers who, you know, I very often, often will kind of do this, the tourist gawk and look up at a building and just kind of take a picture of the person next to me. They think I'm they think I'm looking a tourist in the city, um, but it, it can be a little bit of a, a, a faint for me to a little bit of a cover to pretend. And there's so many people taking so many pictures that, you know, some, if, if, you, if your body language is good, you, you can really be unnoticed amidst it all. So that's the good side. The bad side is the same thing. We're always on our cell phones. Yeah. I'm curious whether anybody's opened your book and found themselves in it. Have you ever had that experience? I have not. It's, it's so funny. The first person identified in the book, his face wasn't even in the photo. He was sitting with a dog and he had a bunch of tattoos and my nephew was over and I'm trying to find the picture quickly. It's not in, it's not in this show. And my nephew came over and he's like, I know that guy. He's an artist. He's a friend of mine. Has he recognized the tattoo? I mean, he's, his face is, and it's just like the picture was taken from here down with the tattoos and the dog. And, and then I had another person tell me he knew a woman in the book and a friend of mine lived downstairs from two of the twins that appeared in a kind of double twin, again, not in this show, but in the book. So I've had, I've had three or four people identified um, <laughs> And any, I've sent them books. I mean, I, I, the one woman, they, they never gave me your name, but the other people who I've identified, I tracked down who they were and their addresses and sent them a book uh, and a print in the case of the twins. Because again, I, 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 I love that they're in my book and I love that they're in my, my picture and, and I want them to see my appreciation. And it's, so it seems a small thing, but that's, that's about it. I'm waiting for the woman on the cover to, to announce yeah. herself. I, I, you know, some people are small and kind of unidentifiable, but yeah, just a couple so far. If any of you are in it, please I send you a book. <laughs> um, and someone is asking, uh, obviously we are, we are showing a virtual gallery so people don't have a sense of what these, how large these images are when you 
normally show them. And so uh, someone has asked that question about how large these images are when you show them in a in a real life gallery. Yeah, I've, I've shown um, at different sizes. I was in a show in San Francisco at the Leica Gallery and I told the gallerist that I had a big printer. So we printed it 60 inches wide, um, huge. Wow. Um, because he was happy that someone could send him a big print for the store. So sometimes you just raise your hand and say, I can print big. But generally, I don't show that large. Um, it, 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 it depends. Um, it, my work is very malleable. And, and as, as a picture on a wall, a street photograph can benefit from being good, but it also can be benefit from being quite small because it, you know, so much art these days has gotten huge, you know, huge, huge, huge. And if you ever go to a show that has small prints, people lean in and oddly, I think pay more attention. So um, I, I, I kind of like it a little bit at this extreme, but I've, I've printed in all sides. Typically, you know, 20 by 30 is a really nice size. It feels substantial, but people might have room for it on the, on their wall. So um, that's a talk about a non-answer to a specific question. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at all. Um, so I, I'm interested in returning to this question that you just touched on uh, when you were uh, actually presenting your work about the pandemic. And obviously the pandemic was very hard on, on everyone in New York City, but I'm just curious what it was like when you when when people were back out on the street and you were beginning, I assume you were in lockdown as well for a while. What a returning to the street felt like and and how the pandemic changed the dynamic of the street and the if it did at all well you know it's interesting as as human beings we tend to ex extrapolate the now into the future so i remember when i first started going out again i was so sad i thought is new york city ever going to come back and you're wary and masked and I, and i didn't you know it it I felt like the city that I had photographed for my book was gone. Um, but slowly, anyone in the city knows it's really coming back to life. Um, a lot of people are still masked. I, 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 I miss seeing people's expressions. I, I you know, if, if we need to be masked, we have to mask. Um, but slowly, little by little, the energy is starting to come back. Um, and it's, it's, I know a lot of photographers out there who are really starting some of the places where the energy is has shifted in the city. Um, but it, and, and the, 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 the kind of the mix of people, there aren't as many commuters. This time of year, there's more tourists. The, the city is just this ever changing, living, breathing entity. And the pandemic has certainly changed um kind of the makeup particularly the, the commuters right now because I, I wonder if they're ever going to come back in the numbers i think people are working from home a couple of days a week you know i could be wrong again you tend to extrapolate the now into the future um but it was very sad in the beginning with so much boarded up and the streets empty and people wary of each other and you didn't want to get too close but a lot of that is dribbling away and we still have to be careful i you know um and it's not everything it was, but I think New York is hard to keep down forever. There's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of people returning who really want to be out with people. I mean, I was kind of hoping that it would be like the roaring 20s, that, that, that it, 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 would, it would just after being confined and inside, there would be this explosion of energy in people. And you're starting to feel that here and there, you know, mm -hmm. but we're still, we're not out of the woods yet. So um we'll see but new york has an irrepressible spirit and you can once again find it if you know where to look um, i'm curious i'm going to combine uh one of my questions for you with uh one of the questions that our audience asked uh, um, about favorite places to photograph and uh our audience member asked whether you ever photograph on the subway um it's funny i don't take the subway a lot because i walk everywhere <laughs> um, I, 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 I stay above ground. I have photographed in the subway. I do like, you know, I will, I feel a little more exposed and a little more intrusive when I'm on the subway. 
I, I, find, I find really great, I'm very comfortable if it's a crowded place um, because I think you're, you're taking a picture is less intrusive. You know, it may not be less intrusive, it may just be a lesson. Um, favorite spots in this city, Washington Square Park now is extremely lively on, on a weekend afternoon and evening. It's a little hard to photograph for me because it's always kind of a mess to make order of the chaos that's going on there is, has proved a bit of a challenge for me, but I run into a lot of friends there, so that's nice. Um, I've always loved Fifth Avenue, 42nd and Fifth Avenue, that corner is, is magic on a Friday, Thursday or Friday afternoon when people are headed to the train or the subway, um, they're can be in, leaving work and tourists going shopping, that's always been a good corner. Sixth Avenue used to be fabulous at lunchtime when the buildings were full of office workers, but they're not so much anymore. Um, I photograph in Chinatown a fair bit because again, I think that's a part of the New York that's has its own unique character um, and it's colorful and, the, and, and the, the people are all out on the street doing their shopping. Again, everyday life, but there's a lot of life on the street. Um, in Chinatown, almost everyone is still masked. So, and, and, and I think, you know, they've faced such kind of discrimination even for being Chinese, which is terrible. And, and but it's cultural as well that, that um, people, that's, I'm finding it a little challenge because again, I love people's faces. It's, it's part of who we are and our expressions are important to my work. So um, yeah, I'll just hunt down, I'll go way downtown. Um, to the World Trade Center and Wall Street area in the summer. There's no light down there in the winter because the buildings are so tall and it's it's just dark and, and kind of dreary. Um, but there's tourists and great architecture and beautiful light in the summertime. I, I tend to just sniff out the crowds. I never wear um, music in my ears. Sometimes you'll hear, you know, a street away, there will be a commotion and you'll run into a protest or a you know, something going on. Sometimes you'll just hear people coming and photograph this group of women and they were having a great time and I heard them a block away. And so you've got to pay, you know, all your senses need to be tuned into the street. But I, I tend to go where the, where the food is, where the crowds are. <laughs> Someone, I, this will be our last question. Someone asked um, whether you've been at this uh, for quite a while now and what excites you about street photography? I think we've heard some of this answer before, but I'll, I'll leave this as your, as your closing uh, answer right. tonight. It's pure chance and it's people and it's human behavior. And you can't, it's an, it's an, anyone who does this knows how incredibly tiring and frustrating it can be because there are days and weeks and months where I'll take a hundred pictures a day and there's nothing. There's nothing that I would show here. I have nothing to show for it. My feet hurt, I'm tired, it's hot. <laughs> but when a picture comes together and you've caught a moment of a family interacting, of this city presenting itself as this beautiful stage in the afternoon light and it's, it's, it's capturing, it's, it's, it's hanging on to life. It's, it's treasuring this moment. That's what the Zen masters tell us to do. All we have is now. And as a street photographer, you're really paying very, very close attention to now. And so the, the process of doing it is, becomes very addictive for people who do it a lot, to be out in it, to be looking at people, to be paying attention to this moment, this now. Uh, it becomes an extremely enticing practice. Um, and then when it all comes together in a picture, you just feel like you, it's a gift. Um, and you've hung, you've hung on to this moment of time that for, for whatever reason to you or someone who likes your photographs is a little bit of a treasure. Well, and it thank was a you. treasure that you gave me this opportunity. And it was so nice. It's so nice to have my work up on on your in your virtual gallery and uh, someday I'll, I'll print it out and come and put it on the walls for you. 
Well, thank you so much. This has been a delightful conversation and I couldn't have hoped for um, uh, a better set of interactions with our audience and with you, Melissa, and also just to see this beautiful work and to hear your uh, talking about it has really been inspirational. Um, it, make, it makes me passionate about New York as well as your work. So um, thank, you. thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank the MAS staff, um, uh, Genevieve Wagner and, and Jen Deloria for tonight's program. They, uh, they did a lot of work to put it together and thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. Um, we especially appreciate MAS's members. If you're not a member and you enjoyed tonight's program, we hope that you'll consider joining. Your membership support helps keep our um, MAS programming and advocacy towards a more livable city possible. Um, see the chat for information about how you can support MAS. We hope you'll keep your eyes peeled for upcoming program announcements for the closeout of the summer. This fall, we, we are excited to host two program series, including our 2022 Masterworks programs and a series recognizing the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. Both series will be a collection of in-person and virtual programs that will spark thoughtful conversation and take event goers across the five boroughs. Stay tuned for these program announcements. Thank you again, Melissa, and thank you to all of us for joining this evening, uh, and please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much.